Hello, we're sat in Hoob headquarters. We've got a lot of kit here that isn't Hoob. I know Dean is going to let us off because I know some of this is quite special stuff. And I've got a thing in front of me that says Helen Cawthorn, Triathlete of the Year from British Triathlon from 1993. That's right, yes, a long time ago. There's some stories to be told here. Quite a few, yes. I was one of the elite triathletes um, back in the day, as it were. And um, I sort of raced for Great Britain from as elite athlete from two, um, 1993 till 2001, which was my last elite competition, um, before I went to become an age group triathlete and won my age group in Edmonton um, that year. And then I sort of, my love for triathlon, I felt I achieved what I wanted to achieve. And um, my, unfortunately, sadly, my dad had died in 2001 and uh, I, my mum needed a bit extra help. So I took to marathon running. My love for triathlon didn't really wane because I was still involved in, in many ways, helping other people. Um, but then... After a poor marathon at London in 2008, I think it was, I thought, oh, I don't like this anymore. I'm going to go back and do some sprint races just to keep fit. You know, my job, I've been promoted at work to assistant head in a local school, um, and I'll do it for fun. Um, well, I did it partly for fun, but I still like the winning, <laughs> <laughs> which I still managed to do on some sprint distance. But um, then in 2001, I was training in the local pool um, and I had two cardiac arrests. So life became very different. So you were an elite level athlete. You would had what you describe as a poor marathon. I'm not going to dwell on what a poor marathon was for you because I've got one to do later on this year. <laughs> so we're not going to talk times. So you were, you were an elite level athlete. You were in... in yes really good health really fit you were you were doing what at the time that you had the cardiac arrest i was swimming okay yeah. but nothing out of the ordinary that day you no done everything you would normally do nothing i anticipated it was valentine's day and so your your heart and valentine's day are, are connected somehow they are somehow and it's always the day that um, i have i'm like the queen i have two birthdays <laughs> Well, on July the 9th, which is my birth date, and Valentine's Day, because uh, it's the day that I technically died for 17 minutes and came, fortunately, medical services brought me back, not once, but twice. So talk to me a bit about that. Then you were, I think you were mid-session? It was towards the end, and I just thought, oh, if I'm quick, I can get another 400 metres in. So I started off, uh, did a tumble turn, pushed off the wall, and that's the last I remember. Now, apparently, I stopped halfway down the pool. I got out um, of the water, and the lifeguard, and these are people I'd known for years, because, you know, I was there frequent, you know, training quite regularly. And um, they just left me alone to get on with it. And they just thought she never gets out halfway down the pool. And one came over and he could feel my heart racing. He propped me up. And I just said, look, my heart feels out of control. Don't worry, I'll be all right. I'll get back in the water soon. Well, he then sort of caught, you know, called across to for an ambulance. Um, didn't say anything to me, but apparently I was slipping down his legs and becoming unconscious because obviously my heart has stopped. Or it was in uh, ventricular fibrillation, which is obviously where it's quivering and not pumping the blood around properly. So yeah. through the, the combination of the, the CPR and the defibrillator and then yeah. the ambulance being close by, you were resuscitated poolside is that right yeah resuscitated they stabilized me sufficiently so then i could be put in the ambulance to go to hospital um, and then unfortunately that was around about 20 to 8 in the morning and then about 11 o'clock when i was in queen's medical center i rested again and they coined their phrase not mine they were running out of options but managed to give me a shot of potassium which did the job so um you know brought me back and then i was stabilized in i was put on life support which i was on for four days gradually over those four days they uh, pull out tubes and bits and pieces to see how you're responding 
and then I was transferred to City, which is a cardiac um, specialist hospital, and I was there for about two and a half weeks. And then I got my own little internal paramedics. So I've got an ICD, which is an internal defibrillator, which keeps me on the straight and narrow. So it either paces the heart back into rhythm if it goes out of rhythm, uh, which you can sort of feel in the background, but not very conscious of. Or if you need it, it gives you a shock which I've only suffered once, so that's been... Uh, and it worked, obviously. Yeah, because I'm here to <laughs> tell the story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you talk about the condition. Yours was an undiagnosed um, condition that you, you had no idea of, but since then it has been diagnosed and, and you have more understanding now. Yeah, I, um, I've i got um, ARVC, arrhythmogenic, right ventricular cardiomyopathy it's a mouthful um, and it is genetically inherited and the only person that we've got any vague sort of connection to is my grandma who suddenly died on the bus she didn't have any chest pain she just literally got on the bus this is in about 1965 and um, said to the conductor then as you know they had conductors said oh I don't feel very well can you come back for the fair which in those days that's what they did came back and she was dead. She didn't have any, as they know, any chest pain, cried out. There was no sort of story behind it. So it could have been that sudden, you know, death, which you obviously hear of, you know, marathon runners who drop dead at the end of a marathon, who, mm. you know, people all f don't think are very, very fit. So, And I, th I think that's part of what your story tells us and tells triathletes across the country is you're, a, you're an exceptionally fit person. You're still very fit and healthy now, but it happened to you. And That's I think there, there may be a danger that some people assume I'm fit and healthy, it isn't going to happen to me. But clearly your story shows us it can. That's right. And it's, um, I think raising awareness of it is the most important bit of it because I was diagnosed with asthma as a child. Um, and so every time I had some breathlessness, I felt there was something wrong. I could never really nail it down. I always put it down to having asthma. And it, and now almost being diagnosed has actually answered a lot of questions of a poor performance following some very good ones, obviously like winning you know, national championships and uh, representing Great Britain at uh, international level. Um, but then things got better again, whether, you know, and so then I was able to win a world championship as an age grouper and run. Our count was getting better. Yeah. <laughs> but there was always this, these blips which would occur and I could never identify really what was going on. And so, yeah, it's about, I think, raising awareness. If you do suffer these, you do need to go and get them checked out. It won't mean that you've got to do nothing again. You can always do things. So I've had 11 years well managed on drugs. Um, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> on heart drugs um, and with, you know, with constant scans and things like that, where, yes, I've not been there to do what I used to do, but at least I can walk a dog. I used to be able to do an easy bike ride on the flat. I could do uh, what I would call a shuffle on a flat piece of ground. Not very far, but, you know, it was me. It was a bit of a run. It was gaining back a bit of the life I had before. And that's what sometimes you've got to do you've got to be realistic about you know what you can do and and how you personally manage it and yes it because of the condition I got or I have the the heart muscle was always going to deteriorate over time and so you know I always knew that in background but I think 11 years has been quite good of you know pretty good pretty good life really so uh, and, and your active lifestyle is shown by the we were to address the, the slight bruising on your face, which was uh, <laughs> coming together with the dry stone wall whilst out walking, is that right? Yes, that's right. I was uh, managed to, uh, <laughs> I was going down to see somebody to ask them how their dog was, because part of the whole recovery process was getting a dog and I could dog walk and... Uh, and Spike the dog has been an absolute godsend in almost a mental 
because he never judged me. He just wants to go out for a walk all the time. So uh, I was going down, I was walking down and I tripped and unfortunately I fell into a dry stone wall and I lost. But maintaining a positive attitude and sense of humour has, you know, got me through all these scrapes. <laughs> and that, that, that shines through and, you know, we talked before that uh, you feel very fortunate, you feel lucky that you talked about having a second birthday now. Yeah. And you know that we have a, a partnership with London Hearts to try and help our tri triathlon clubs across the country access defibrillators, yeah. you know, portable defibrillators that can go out on bike rides, that can go out on running routes, that could be around open water swimming. And I guess your message would be to everybody to, to make sure they have some training in CPR, they understand that, and defibrillators are, are available where they can be. That's right. I think it's very, very important about defibrillators. They should be on every sports ground. Um, you only have to see from, you know, you should hear a story where they had one, the person survived, they didn't have one, they didn't make it. It's just so, so crucial for something that can just put your heart back into rhythm, you may never need one again. It's just there, it might be just a blip or it might be an undiagnosed condition that then can be followed up and the person can actually enjoy a well-managed life. And that's all it sometimes takes. And I always said to the children that I trained and I just said, the worst thing you can do is nothing. Because even if you're the person that calls the ambulance, who starts a little, a few compressions, you know, Vinnie Jones was it, the footballers who did it to stay, staying alive. Well, that was fantastic because it gave people a rhythm to do it. Um, and also, even if you push a little bit, at least if it keeps the blood circulating, you're keeping the oxygen circulating and it gives that person a chance which is the most important thing. Mm. And you, you have a story to tell and had that's the prompt it. actions not happened of, of lifeguards on that morning, you might not have a story to tell. Well, that's right. And uh, I was lucky enough to also, the British Heart Foundation came and did a little uh, video um, called Helen's Story and all about the condition and about, you know, being a teacher and how it happened. And, you know, if that just helps one or two people, then, you know, it's, it's all worth it, really. So. And that's, that's the point of us talking today, really, is to talk to our triathlon clubs across, across England and put forward the, the importance of defibrillators, of first aid training, understanding how to how to help in that situation. And hopefully listening to your story can, can at least speak to some of those clubs. That's right, yes. it's uh, Yeah, and I'm more than happy to get involved in any of those sort of levels. Um, hopefully I'll come along looking a lot more presentable. And you'll, be, <laughs> you'll always be welcome along at any, anything that we're doing. It's, I mean, it's been, it has been great to talk to you, Helen. Thank you for your help. And when I look back at what you've done, I know that you've got a, what you call a bad marathon, which I call a very good one. Um, Helen Cawthorn, thanks a lot for talking to us. No problem. Absolute a pleasure. Conversation. Thank, Thank you. you.